drop out there, which will be back in uh, shortly again. So is Patsy. And Patsy, fine, yeah. Um, so in terms of the chairperson's business, um, I've been made aware that there has been an amendment to the uh, UK Environment Bill, which will modify the OEP's duty to monitor and, power, and the power to report on the implementation of the protocol uh, environmental law under paragraph 2 of Schedule 3. Provide that the OEP must not monitor or report on matters within the remit of the Committee on Climate Change, which is defined in subparagraph 2b by reference to specific provisions of the Climate Change Act 2008. Can I seek agreement to press a written update from the Department on the impl potential implications of this amendment? Yep. Yep. Um, draft Minister, the 15th of October. Draft Minister, on pages 6 to 15. Um, are members okay if I. Um, am I okay, okay with the minutes? Yep. Um, any matters arising from them? Okay. okay, we're moving now to item five in the agenda, which is the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Trading Scheme Order 2020. The uh, papers are on in your packs. Um, memo from Stella, at page 4 to 14 of the table papers. Correspondence of the Department at pages 15 to 17 of the table of papers. Uh, correspondence of the Department alongside the SI at pages 18 to 156. Further papers in the packet 57 to 223. And I want you to note that this, uh, that this is a letter from our sister committee in the Welsh Parliament, page 20, 224 to 225. And that they should, we should also note that the SI has been approved by the Scottish Parliament. Um, so I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome by a Starleaf John Mills, uh, Grade 5 Head of Environmental Policy Division, Richard Coe, Grade 7 Environmental Policy Division, Hugh McGinn, uh, Grade 7 Principal Scientific Officer, Phil Elliott, uh, Senior Scientific Officer. And I'd like to invite the officials to um, commence their briefing. Commence the briefing there. John. Here's Hugh or John or Phil. Um, it's uh, Richard Curry here. Um, good morning, committee. Um, I'm not sure if uh, John Mills is on the line. Yeah. Um, I think he was supposed to be. Um, well, I, I if he's not, his name animated, but his face hasn't appeared yet. Mm -hmm. So if. Uh, if some of the three just want to begin the, the briefing and members and then John may join in, would that be okay? Yeah, yeah, that's fine, that's fine. Um, uh, well, good morning, uh, good morning, Chair, good morning, Committee. Um, uh, well, as you know, with me this morning are, well, hopefully, uh, Mr. Mills and uh, uh, Hugh McGinn from the agency and Phil Elliott, um, who works alongside myself in the Emissions Trade and Policy team. Uh, as you'll be aware, we briefed the committee on the Emissions Trading Scheme and the statutory instrument, the uh, Greenhouse Gas Emissions Trading Scheme Order 2020 on the 17th of September. The order is uh, now scheduled for debate in the Assembly on the 3rd of November, as previously agreed by the Executive, when it approved the policy approach back in May. This is a week earlier than we had originally anticipated. So once again, we find that we're working to present time skills. The need to bring the debate forward as soon as the order, if passed, can be cleared at a Privy Council meeting on the 11th of November. The order establishes the legal framework for a UK emissions trading scheme. This will replace our current membership of the EU emissions trading scheme, which will cease at the end of this year. An exception to this is that Northern Ireland generators, power generators, will remain in the EU ETS to maintain a level playing field in the field of the single electricity market. Note that the order is being debated on the 3rd of November, and it doesn't, the order that's being debated on the 3rd of November doesn't provide for this. Separate legislation is being drafted to do this under the Withdrawal Act, and it is, the intention is that for that to be laid in November 2020 in Westminster. A further complication is that the UK government is keeping another option open, that of implementing a carbon emissions tax instead of UK ETS. We have no insight into when that decision is to be made and whether it would be affected by the outcome of negotiations. At the last committee session, we were asked about a local impact assessment of these changes. 
And subject to Minister's approval, of course, we said we would provide that to the committee for the debate on the order, and that remains the case. I should be clear on one point, though an impact assessment has been carried out and was published a lot. Richard, we're, we're losing you. I'll say, I'll be able to carbon pricing back. Richard, could you just replace that, repeat that last point because so, Rob Ann's cutting out. <coughs> All right, right, okay. Um, I said I should be clear on one point. Uh, an impact assessment has been carried out um, and was published along, along with the UK and devolved administration's response to the consultation on the future of UK carbon pricing back in July. This was a UK assessment and it covered Northern Ireland but was not disaggregated by region. So, likewise, there was no similar there was no separate assessments for Wales, Scotland, or England. The UK impact assessment on our own outline compare the moving compare moving from the UK ETS with staying within the EU ETS. Um, I wouldn't want anybody to get too excited though about the local impact assessment. The impact made by the order is very small, and that's for two reasons. First, the vast majority of our emissions and ETS costs arise from generators who are staying within the EU ETS, so there's no impact there. Secondly, the policy approach taken and established in the UK ETS is to make transition from the EU to the UK schemes as smooth as possible for operators. There is no marked impact of the change in the schemes, and there is not intended to be. There is a more stringent cap in the UK scheme, but free alliances are retained to the at EU scheme levels, and there is sufficient headroom to mitigate any impact. In terms of time change ambition, there is a commitment to review the UK ETS in light of forthcoming advice from the Committee on Climate Change on achieving the net zero target. At the last committee meeting, uh, in where, where we discussed the uh, ETS um, on the 17th of September, you were provided with a UK ETS common framework summary note. And, um, we're told that the phase three cabinet office review had been completed. Work has progressed well in both the framework agreement and the concordat, and will shortly be subject to DA uh, ministerial right round. The FOA and concordat will then go to joint ministerial committee, and then it will be available for scrutiny by the uh, by the air committee. So I spoke to conclude uh, opening remarks. I would just uh, stress a few key points on the order in question. The order is to establish a UK ETS being debated in all, and it's being debated in all four UK legislatures and needs to be passed in them all. The purpose of the UK ETS is to encourage cost effective greenhouse gas emissions reductions, which contributes to the net zero target. The scheme's scope includes energy intensive industries, the electricity generation sector, except in Northern Ireland generators, and includes aviation and establishes a cap on annual emissions. By virtue of the Northern Ireland Protocol, Northern Ireland electricity generators will remain within the EU ETS to maintain a level playing field of carbon cost for the single electricity market on the island of Ireland. In the UK ETS, the initial level of the cap will be 5% below that, which would have been the case as we stayed in the EU ETS. This means that the UK standard is more ambitious than if we had stayed in the EU ETS, but the impact is limited in the early years to provide for a smooth transition. This will be reviewed in light of advice from the climate, uh, Committee on Climate Change. And finally, I'll just state that the order also establishes monitoring, reporting, verification and enforcement arrangements. In Northern Ireland, the regulator will be the Northern Ireland Environment Agency. And that concludes my remarks. Uh, thank you, Chair. Okay. Um, do any of the other um, officials want to add or say anything before I open up to questions to the members? Nothing from you. That, that's okay. That's sound. Right. Um, we'll go move. Oh, let's move around the room. Philip, you would be okay there. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Richard, for that. I mean, and obviously, anything, uh, any proposal that uh, reduces greenhouse gas emissions is to be welcome, but there, there's a few issues that stood out for, for me uh, in terms of the, this ETS scheme. Uh, I mean, for example, there, there, and I know you said with regards to the North, not to get too excited because 
those uh, industries within the uh, single energy market uh, aren't uh, in included in this. But there is still uh, you know, a number of companies that this will have an impact here in the north. And you know, as we, we were discussing uh, within committee this morning, you know, there are huge amounts of money uh, or large amounts of money uh, in terms of trading these, um, these uh, uh, carbon budgets. Uh, so, I mean, like, I just have a concern that uh, about the regulation because, I mean, obviously, in the assembly we've had the RHI scheme, we've had recent uh, the the Nairo scheme. So, is there any potential for e exploitation of, within <coughs> this scheme with regard to trading uh, and companies maybe making uh, or exploiting it to make uh, sums of money? The, the, the other question I wanted to ask, just in regard to the potential for a carbon tax scheme being introduced over and above the CTS scheme, because uh, emissions is a devolved uh, matter, but tax isn't a devolved matter. So, I mean, if I could just ask for clarification in the sense of <coughs> the level of how this emission scheme is devolved. So, does local industry here benefit? Does the money that that comes from this tax be fed <coughs> into help this local? The local companies, uh, or does it come back to the executive, or what decision-making powers do we have uh, in terms of the devolution of, of this scheme? And I mean, the other thing uh, you would said about the committee on climate change producing a report, which may then have an impact on the, a review of this. Well, Claire, who's not with us, but uh, on behalf of a number of parties, has submitted a private members' bill to bring in a climate act here for the north. So, how would that, if we had a climate act in the north? Within a year, a year and a half, how would that have an impact on any of this? And then my final point or question is, what happens if the Assembly <coughs> doesn't support this at the debate? I'm not saying that's likely to happen, but you know, what would happen if the Assembly doesn't support this ETS scheme? Okay, um, just to, to answer your questions in order, I'll maybe start with the, the last point there, uh, Philip. Um, in relation to what potentially might happen if this isn't supported in the assembly, um, I suppose in theory what could happen is that the scheme could go ahead on a UK or a, or a GB basis and, don't, and wouldn't include Northern Ireland, which would leave a, a carbon pricing gap in respect of Northern Ireland. How that would be done um, legislatively, um, I, I can't uh, profess to be familiar or an expert enough in the, the legal detail to answer that question, but as I say, it would be a possibility. Um, in terms of a uh, carbon tax, um, the main difference between a carbon tax and the emissions trading scheme is that the emissions trading scheme um, is, is driven by market forces, so it fluctuates on a daily basis, so the price of carbon would fluctuate on a daily basis, whereas the price of carbon under a carbon emissions tax would be set at a set level and we, would be reviewed uh, by the UK government in the budget, in the annual budget. So the, the carbon price would be set at a set level on an annual basis, so it wouldn't fluctuate. Um, the, uh, whether or not this is open to abuse um, by, uh, by companies in terms of how they manage their alliances and buy and sell alliances, I suppose the first point I would make is that the same processes apply will apply under a future UK ETS as have applied under an EU ETS. Um, ourselves in DERA and within uh, the environment agency don't um, aren't familiar with the uh, the market the market trading behaviour of the companies who participate in this. So it's not something we're aware of. But carbon alliances, carbon is like a, is a commodity like any other commodity, so it can be traded as such. Um, but I wouldn't expect any change in market behaviour or behaviour of participants or their agents uh, on the, the transition to this new scheme, um, given that it's following the same principles as the EU ETS. Um, I'm not sure, Philip, has that, has that covered your main points? Is, is there anything I've missed there? I, I feel like I might have missed something. Just in relation to the... Uh, the review from the Committee on Climate Change, if it, uh, if it suggests lowering this, uh, how, how would that impact? And, and if we had our own Climate Act here in the North, how would that have any impact on any future ETS schemes? Okay. Um, 
I have to confess I don't know, I haven't seen the detail of the, uh, the climate change uh, legislation that was uh, introduced yesterday. Um, obviously the carbon emissions tag isn't ideal because it, it doesn't fluctuate, um, but in terms of the principles behind the carbon emissions tax, the, under the UK emissions scheme, there's a, a free allowances will be allocated to companies who, um, I think we explained free allowances and free allocation in the, on the previous uh, presentation on the 17th. The amount of free allocation, I think, is going to be mirrored in the amount of allowances granted for free under a carbon emissions tax. So there'll be similarities there in terms of, um, I suppose, incentives for companies to, to keep their incentive to keep their emissions down. And the carbon emissions tax would then apply for it to any emissions over and above those uh, the, the number of allowances allocated free under the carbon emissions tax. So um, there still be there would still be that incentive to reduce emissions, but the difference, the main difference being that the carbon price would be set on an annual basis and wouldn't fluctuate. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, John. Yeah, th thank you, Chair. Th thanks, Richard, for the information. Um, I raised concern previously, and, uh, and I remain concerned, that the uh, UK government had not included Northern Ireland in, in direct consultation uh, around the, the impact assessment. And, and as I say, that remains the case with me. Can I ask, though, I think some of the detail you've given already has answered questions that I was likely to ask, but I'm keen to know um, what consideration is given by the department when they're presenting an analysis either to us or anyone else on this on the balance of the need between the environment and the economy stroke business um, for example uh, the, the uh, UK proposed ETS versus the, the uh, EU scheme and if the uh, UK cap is lower as has been stated then what the environmental impact of that is, and separately also, um, as a different strand, should we be looking at the the uh, carbon pricing of installations like muni municipal waste incinerators, given that there are still those intent in building these in this jurisdiction? Okay, um, as regards, um, John, the uh, the impact of the five percent reduction in the cap, the proposed five percent reduction uh, cap. Um, this, I think, equates to something like one hundred and fifty six million tons of carbon per year uh, in terms of available allowances. Um, it was in the first year of the UK ETS. Now, in terms of predicted business as usual emissions for uh, the industries. Would, going to be captured by a uh, UK ETS. Um, this, uh, it's predicted that those emissions would be something like 126 to 131 million tonnes. Um, so there is sufficient headroom in the, uh, in the number of allowances that are going to be available in the first year of the scheme to cover what would be predicted in terms of emissions. Um, so I suppose that, that, that's, that's been done to facilitate the transition from the EU scheme into the UK scheme, but with the reduction in cap signaling the intention for the increased uh, uh, for the for the greater climate ambition in the part of the UK as opposed to the UK, uh, the EU scheme. So there's sufficient headroom that there to cover the protected alliances initially. Um, so I think that that was done to strike a balance between climate ambition and the impact on businesses in transition to a new scheme. Uh, in terms of the scope, widening the scope of the scheme and bringing in further industries. I suppose again, I would state that um, to facilitate transition into the new scheme from the EU to the UK ETS, the scope um, of, this, of the scheme at the start initially is to keep the, the scope, to include the industries that are included and uh, would have been included on the EU ETS. But um, there will be the scheme will be reviewed uh, during the first phase and. Okay, I suppose there's the possibility that we could bring in future uh, the further uh, installations and further industry, uh, further sectors into that scheme in the future. But initially, uh, the, the scope was kept the same as the EU ETS to facilitate a smooth transition into the new scheme. Thank you. 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 Th
but that's not the rule out that uh, there won't be a few uh, further sectors included in any future future uh, uh, iteration or revision of the scheme. Okay, thank you. Um, before we just move around, just just on that point there, um, Richard. Um, I know that the, 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 there, there's a cap set, and that cap will, will lower over over time. Um, will will this be harmonised with changes to the cap within the EU ETS? You know, obviously, because we want to prevent carbon leakage. Yeah, as uh, I suppose the uh, our preferred option would be that we would have a scheme that would be linked with the EU emissions trading scheme, and. Um, you know that would create a you know it would create a wider carbon market and create a wider availability of alliances to uh, sectors across uh, both UK and the EU. Um, and under that scenario, um, then I, I would I would suggest that uh, in terms of uh, cap reduction, there would be more potential or scope for alignment. Um, the EU, I suppose, are always uh, can kind of. Uh, Always uh, review their scheme as well. I'm not familiar enough with the review schedule. Um, I'm not sure if you or Phil would be any more familiar with it than I am. But uh, that that scheme will be reviewed as well, and there is a potential for um, the cap to be just there. Also, um, how that would align with the UK ETS, I'm not sure. Ideally, we would have to say we would have a light scheme, but uh, and that would be the preferred you know, preferred option. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my query is again back to the impact assessment. Yeah, we're told that it was a UK wide assessment. Was there any drilling done down in any drilling down into the submissions by any of the Northern Ireland companies? So that we could get at least a Northern Ireland perspective on it? Uh, no, in the, in the impact assessment that was carried out initially by the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy to support the, the, the statutory instrument, it wasn't possible to disaggregate that um, information down into uh, to an administration level, um, and that includes Northern Ireland as well as the, the three other countries within the UK. Um, but uh, we are uh, finalising a local impacts paper, which does look at the impacts in Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, we would hope to get that um, finalised very shortly. Uh, indeed, we would, would expect to have that with the committee prior to the, the proposed date of debate on the 3rd of November. And that impact assessment will um, drill down to the Northern Ireland specific level. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm asking you to maybe do a bit of uh, crystal ball gazing here now, but if there is no deal, what would the impact be on the carbon tax or the UK ETS? Uh, unfortunately, I can't answer that question. Um, I think the same question came up, uh, um, I think it was back at the start of September, in a debate in, in Westminster, and the uh, the best minister, uh, Kwasi Kwarteng, was able, unable to give any insight into what would happen in terms of or what scenario would produce either a UK ETS or a carbon emissions tax? Um, so, unfortunately, I don't have the answer to that question. Um, we would hope to get clarity on that soon. And uh, as soon as we do, we will, uh, of course, share the information. But unfortunately, um, I, can't, uh, I, can't, I can't at this stage say when the decision will be made or what, under what, what circumstances um, the. Uh, either the outcome would either be a UK emissions trading scheme or a carbon emissions tax. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Richard. In terms of costs, Richard, ETS versus carbon tax, would the, the overall cost to the emitters be similar? Um, the, uh, the value of the carbon emissions tax is yet to be set, the value per tonne of carbon. But, um, and Phil uh, or Hugh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think the level of carbon tax is going, the proposal is to base that on the predicted, what they predict the carbon value per tonne would be for the next six months and what that has been for the previous six months. So I think they'll try and align that as closely as possible to what they would predict 
uh, emissions trading scheme carbon price to be, and what the EU emissions trading carbon price has been. So that that but that tax will be set by um, the Treasury. Well, so as it's a it's a reserve matter, but the intent is to keep that as close as possibly aligned to what the predicted price would be under ETS. Obviously, there's no guarantee there, um, and the underground emissions trading scheme, the carbon value will fluctuate, and you know nobody can predict well you know how high or how low it will go. And under a carbon tax, it will be set, but as I say, it should be set as such a to try and align as closely as possible with what the values would be predicted to be under an emissions trading scheme. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, uh, maybe Richard, I can uh, just input there, uh, Phil Elliott here. Um, the the, uh, the mechanism of setting the price of carbon uh, is based on the auction reserve price of £15 per tonne, which is the lower level, then using the cost containment mechanism has an upper ceiling. So the modelling has predicted uh, that the carbon price uh, window would be between £15 and £32 uh, for the years of 2021 to 2024. Okay. So that, that, that's the window that they estimate the carbon price to be uh, for UK ETS, uh, and then that will be reviewed. Yep. That's okay. My next question would have been when would that be reviewed, but you've answered us. That's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. For it. Yep. William. Thank you. Sorry. Um, um, the ETF's trading scheme and the proposal is that the UK sets a price for the trading uh, of emission tax. Is that to protect smaller companies? You know, I would have thought, and you know, I'm just thinking out loud here. You know, the difficulty with a free trading scheme does it not leave a very large companies at an advantage? They can afford to pay more. No. Well, I suppose uh, there is a protection under the emissions trading scheme in terms of free alliances. So companies that would be vulnerable to is it, say what's classed as carbon leakage, which is when a company may decide to relocate the jurisdiction which doesn't have a carbon price or has a lower has a lower carbon price, will be allocated a certain amount of free alliances to allow them to continue to operate. And um, that's <clears throat> Similar to what has been the case under the EU emissions trading scheme for the past 20 years, um, and has uh, it, it, it hasn't financially disadvantaged anybody. Um, and then for the smaller operators, um, there is the facility for a uh, small emitters opt out, <clears throat> um, whereby they can opt out of the formal trading scheme, and then they're issued allowance. They're issued a, a target as such. To aim towards um, in terms of emissions, so they don't they don't trade in the open market, but if they breach the allowance that they're allocated, then uh, um, they have to pay a civil penalty. Um, Hugh, you can maybe keep you right here. Is that correct? That's correct. If they fail to meet their target, they have to purchase the value of the target breach. So if they were hundred tons over their target, they would have a penalty for hundred tons of CO two. But uh, I suppose. To, to answer your question, I suppose um, this scheme won't make any difference in terms of what has been the case under the EU ETS, so won't disadvantage anybody anymore. I won't put them in any other uh, different situation as what they would have been had they remained in the EU ETS. That's okay. That's good. That's okay. That makes it clear. Thank you. Uh, just before, again, just for clarity before I conclude here, because I have no more members looking to look in here. Um, at the, Again, the last the last uh, briefing we received from you, is, the point was made that these uh, um, alliances can be banked and traded and sold to reduce the GHG, and they're uh, they're at twenty seven pound per alliance. Um, are, are, they, are these alliances? Uh, is there a finite number of these particular alliances, or how, how's that regulated? Because I'm just thinking, you know, just say if somebody had a certain number of alliances, what what would you know, stop them just holding on to them, you know, until the price of them would raise and then they'd, put, they'd start trading them again, you know. You know what, you know, is there a finite number of these or, or how, how, what's, the, again, how's it regulated, I suppose, the last thing I want to just draw back on again? Well, I suppose uh, the first point to make would be that there's a cap on alliances, so there's a finite number of alliances that are, uh, 
that are established under the scheme. Yeah. Now, those alliances are set or into they're in a number of categories, subdivided into a number of categories. There are a number of alliances within that cap that are set aside for free allocation to those companies that are entitled to a free alliance. There's a certain amount of alliances set aside in what's called the new entrance reserve for companies that pay new companies coming online that may be entitled to a free alliance or a free allocation. And then there's a separate set of alliances, a separate section of alliances that are available for auction and trading on the open market. Now, how those alliances are traded and the trading behavior and market behavior of the individual companies and brokers trading in carbon is something I don't profess to be an expert in, and it's something us as a department and as a regulator don't get involved in. Um, so, yes, I suppose to answer your question, there is the possibility that people are broken, brokers will buy up alliances and hold on to those and then trade them, buy them and sell them like they would do any other commodity. Um, but in terms of the number of alliances that are available, as I say there is a cap there, and within that cap there are the various sections set aside for various for the different purposes, the entrance reserve, reallocation, and those that can be traded on the open market. So, yes, it's it's carbon's a commodity like any other commodity, and can be traded as such. Um, as regards market behaviour, uh, I'm not an expert, so can't comment on that. And in fact, as I say, we don't just don't have that information. Yeah. Uh, Richard, maybe if I could just add that as well, in, in terms of the uh, finance side, um, the, the, there are two finance uh, statutory instruments that sit alongside this um, order and council um, under the Finance Act, which uh, cover the auctioning uh, of alliances and the role of the National Conduct Authority. So there's checks and balances there um, through, through Treasury that there's not abuse of, of the system as well. Thanks, okay, thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to just take the opportunity now to thank uh, the uh, officials for your attendance here today and for your comprehensive answers to all of our questions. Um, so thank you very much. So are the members content that we have, um, you know, between what we've heard today and also what we discussed in the um, previous closed session, content that we uh, have sufficiently discussed this matter? Fair enough? Okay, thank you. Now, so we're going to move on to item six in the agenda, which is an oral briefing from DERA, um, uh, the uh, SL1 uh, plant. It's not an oral briefing, it's written. Oh, sorry, sorry, it's a written briefing, actually. Yes. Written briefing. Uh, so SL1, plant health and diseases of animals, amendment to UX regulation 2020. Uh, it's pages 18 to 25 of the table papers. I want to advise members that the SL1 will be laid under the draft affirmative resolution procedure. I want to advise members that according to the documents from DERA that in 2018 and 2019 a number of statutory instruments were laid at Westminster to ensure that domestic legislation could operate in the event that the UK left the EU without an agreement. Some of those SA amended local legislation for which the department has responsibility. They were taken forward at Westminster to ensure transparency and scrutiny in the absence of Fully functioning assembly and are due to come under operation at the end of the transition period. <coughs> While there are some provisions in the SIs that are still needed because they reflect that the um, the is no longer a member state, some changes uh, made in them no longer align with the uh, uh, withdrawal agreement and protocol. Um, the SR will amend primary legislation relating to plant health and animal health and welfare revoke the relevant provisions in the No Deal SA and make some technical amendments to ensure that the depart departmental primary legislation aligns with the protocol. Uh, the amendments uh, contained in the SA are technical in nature and do not involve policy changes that have not been subject to public consultation as there is no statutory requirement to consult on them. Uh, and members, any questions? Members happy enough that this SL1 moves to the next stage? Yep. Great. Okay. Um, okay, so the uh, okay, the, the, the DERA, the written evidence from DERA, the marketing of plant and propagated material, amendment to UX regulation twenty twenty. The um, papers are on page twenty six to thirty four of the table of papers. The SR will be made under an affirmative uh, resolution procedure. The Department has advised that the passing into law of the European Union Withdrawal Act 2020 has meant there has been necessary to review the plant health 
uh, operable reg legislation, leg legislative position in respect of the agreement, including the protocol, in particular, Directive 9856 EDC on the marketing of propagating material of ornamental plants, and Directive 208 M2 EDC on the marketing of vegetable propagating and planting material um, other than seed are not included in Annex 2 of the protocol. As a result, the Section 2 functions of the European Committee's Act 1972, including powers to make domestic legislation in these policy areas, will not be available to the era post transition. The European Union Act 20, Withdrawal Act 2020, 2018 allows for the transfer to DERA of the Section 2.2 functions applicable to these two directives. Provided this transfer occurs in advance of transition, the 2.2 powers in respect to these policy areas will continue to be available to DERA. DERA advises that there is no statutory duty to consult on the SR, the draft SR. The draft SR makes legislative consensus changes by transferring functions from the directives to the department that does not represent a change in policy. Um, a member is okay with that there moves to the next page. Okay. Um, next piece of evidence is the written evidence is the SL1 Agriculture Animals and Agriculture Health and Education Welfare Trade, etc. Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2020. Uh, it's on pages uh, 35 to 47 of the table papers. Uh, regulations will be made under the negative resolution procedure. Uh, I want to advise members that a number of statutory instruments were made in Westminster to ensure that domestic legislation could operate in the event that the UK left the EU without an agreement. Some of those SIEs amended local legislation for which the Department has responsibility. They were taken forward to Westminster to ensure transparency and scrutiny in the absence of a fully functioning assembly and are due to come into operation at the end of the transition period. While there are some provisions in the SIs that are still needed because they reflect that the UK is no longer a member state, some changes made in them would be incompatible with the withdrawal agreement and protocol. The draft SR evokes the offending provisions contained in some of those SIs and makes some technical amendments to ensure that the departmental legislation aligns with the protocol. The SR amends provisions in a number of different uh, pieces of subordinate legislation related to agriculture, animal health and agriculture. Uh, Dear advises that the amendments are technical. Um, are members any comments or do you have enough to move to the next legislative stage? Have enough? Okay. Um, so SL1 seed marketing, uh, item 9 in your agenda. Correspondence from the department is to page 230 to 232. The draft SR is 233 to 236. Explanatory memorandum 237 to 240. And the human rights and equality screening at 241 to 272. The rule will be laid under the negative resolution procedure and will come into operation in November. It's a business as normal SL1 and not part of preparations for EU exit. The purpose of the regulation is to amend the seed marketing regulations 2016 in order to expose the requirements of Commission implementing directives uh, 2019 and 2032 and 2021-77 and ensure the Department fully complies with its obligations under EU law. In addition, Regulation 2.2 of the rule corrects an incidental omission from the 2016 regulations, allowing the Department to permit temporary derogations from the germination requirements to remove any in general supply of seed. The Department will act as, as the Member State to temporarily let the marketing of seed not satisfying the requirements with <coughs> respect to the minimum germination laid down in the 2016 regulations for the purposes of Commission Regulation EC number. 2017 to 006. Um, are members okay? This moves to the next page. Okay, um, okay we're going to just uh, move then to our consideration of the <coughs> SIs. I'm going to ask the committee to note that, uh, that at the request that you have five SIs were put onto the committee agenda. We've now been advised by the department that four SIs have already been laid at Westminster and the Minister has given his consent. No papers were provided in time to be included in the uh, pack or the table pack, and the, the committee can, therefore can no, can, cannot consider these. One of the SIs, uh, AQ4, the air quality NA protocol regulations, was laid in error and will now be revoked and laid again. There will be no role review the department in any of these SIs. Um, do you have any questions? They'll just be forwarded to the department for answer. Okay. Um, sorry? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, next thing is we have written evidence DERA, uh, DEFRA WES, or the Waste and Environmental Permitting 
um, Regulations 2020, Category 3. Can advise members of the Department to advise that the dear Minister has given his consent and that this SA has already been laid at Westminster. More, no papers were received in time for the table pack. At, uh, can that therefore be considered by the committee? Okay, uh, evidence again, evidence DERA, uh, the AQ04 air quality regulation 2020, uh, the table corresponds 48 to 5. The department has advised that this essay has been made in Westminster in error and will be revoked and relayed. It will therefore, uh, can that therefore be considered by the committee? Um, my mind is any questions? All agents available in there? Any questions? Probably enough. Okay. Item 12, oral evidence, uh, oh, sorry, written evidence, DEFRA CHM 12, the control of mercury regulation 2020. One of the vice members of the department has, has advised that the dear minister has given his consent and that this has already been laid at Westminster. Papers weren't received in time for the table pack and we cannot therefore consider it by the committee. Or uh, evidence, DERA SA DEFRA ENV. 23, the Environment Miscellaneous Amendment to EU Exit Regulation 2020, Category 1. Correspondence is at pages 277 to 281. Near PAX, the, um, the Department has advised that the Dear Minister has given his consent and that this SA already has been laid at Westminster, and there, therefore we cannot consider it at the committee. Um, and again, if you have any questions, forward it to the Department for comment. Uh, again, the evidence, dear evidence, reserved DEFRA WST09, the hazardous waste substances and packaging, 2020. This, uh, this uh, SR is a reserve matter which has already been laid at Westminster and therefore um, it cannot be or will be considered by the committee and no papers were provided to the committee. Uh, okay, a written update, uh, update on the EU preparation and delivery. Two written updates in the department at pages 56 to 65 of your table of papers. Um, are members okay to note this update? Fair enough. If any questions, okay. Again, uh, written update, uh, written briefing, the consultation on further education support and charging uh, policy at Calfrey. Briefings at 285 to 296. It's a summary of the consultation responses to the department's consultation on further education support and charging policy at Calfrey. The Department advised that the consultation ran from the 1st of June to the 18th of September, and uh, which was a longer time than period due to than longer time period than normal due to COVID. A total of 22 responses uh, were received, 19 were from the consultation. The six million questions and a breakdown per respondent is included at page 295, 296. Um, okay, uh, are members okay to request that the Department updates the committee on the next stage of this? Whenever it progresses on. Okay. Correspondence um, number eight, 17 year agenda. Um, the correspondence is a three, 303 to 416. There's a couple of items I want to draw your attention to. Uh, correspondence from Youth Climate Action NA at page, one, at page 414. They've now confirmed they wish to meet informally with the committee. They have been asked to provide a, a one page of the issues that they wish to discuss. The meeting will be arranged for a Tuesday lunch time and will be a virtual meeting organised in Starleaf and we will be informed of the meeting. The um, Committee for Finance has forwarded to the ERA Committee a letter from the Finance Minister regarding future replacement for EU funding. It notes that cap and structural funds will be replaced by domestic uh, replacements, farm funding and shared prosperity fund re respectively. And there are some concerns about how elements of this funding can be calculated. Um, can, uh, can, can we get members content that we request a written um, a written briefing on this here because there's a couple of items concern that was flagged up on that. Okay. I think that's very appropriate. Okay. Um, a member content to action the remainder of the correspondence outlined in the index page 298 to 301. Yeah. There's also a number of items uh, of correspondence in the table papers at page 69 to set 177. Are we happy enough to come as committee happy to enough to action this as outlined in the table correspondence? Page of 67 of the table pack. Okay. Okay, the uh, next item on the agenda is I want to have any other business members, have any other particular items of business they wish to raise? Okay for now. Okay. Uh, there's, there's a, and some queries in relation to, and that's something maybe the committee could write to the department. 
I've requested an answer and haven't got it yet. The importation of seed potatoes and yeah. potatoes from the UK and Scotland post, you know, yeah. after the 1st of January. There are some concerns. There's quite a few potatoes are imported into Northern Ireland and then subsequently goes on to the chip shops and all in the Irish Republic. So there is issues around that. I'm not sure how that's going to work. And yeah. Maybe the committee could say that some concerns about this and just see, is there any guidance on, on it? But there is... The, the potatoes we grow in Northern Ireland doesn't seem to be up to standard to the, chi the local chippies and the chippies in the Irish Republic, so a lot of them are imported from East Anglia and the south of England. Oh, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. They, they tend to be drier. They're different. Yeah. 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 Drier, that's right, that's right. The drier climate down there, yeah. yeah. That's a fair point. I think um, I, was, I was listening to Dr. Dr. Vivian Gra Gra Gravy on the radio this morning, been before the committee here on a number of occasions, highlighting uh, the concerns uh, generally about the importation seeds to hear from across the well, I hadn't heard that, it was, you know, I didn't. I was uh, on the radio, um, William, so yeah, uh, uh, that is a concern, so I do think it, it would be fair to highlight that and come from the department, uh, right to the department about that. Uh, yeah, no, I think it's a concern for all seeds, for different, yeah. it might be potato seeds and it might be other seeds too, yeah, so I think we need to get further clarification from the department. The sizable amounts of seed potatoes comes into Northern Ireland, yes. I think, you know, even to the Irish Republic too. So, it's, it, 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 it is an issue. Yeah, I'm glad you raised that, William. Because I had it in my head when I heard Dr. <laughs> Gravy speaking on this morning on the radio about it. So, I'm glad you raised that, uh, William. Okay. Um, so, before I've only someone asked members to note that we'll we're going to have a closed session now just to discuss some issues, including the forward work program for, for, for November and December. And the next meeting will be uh, take place on Thursday, the 5th of November, at 10 a.m. here in room 30, part of the building. So uh, thank you, and then we'll move into closed session just to discuss our fire broke program. Okay, thank you. Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.